Good morning and welcome to Bazaar Morning Call. I am Anuj with me, Prashant and Sonia. We start a new series today. Of course, it's Friday as well. So, uh, let's see. The market, of course, has a lot of cues. Uh, but uh, this data on one side and this price action on the other side, I give a lot of importance to price action, of course. Uh, the US Q2 GDP number has been revised uh, uh, slightly better from minus 0.9 to minus 0.6%. That's important because you have that Fed chairman speech today at Jackson Hole Symposium. That's something that a lot of people would want to watch out for. Expectation is that he's likely to remain hawkish, but the market knows it. Uh, the US market, in fact, closed at the highest point of the day, and the point I make, the last hour being the most important one, it had a last hour flourish, while in our market, we had that last hour collapse, the Nifty fell 200 points in last hour, but it could have been expiry factor. Today, of course, we start a new series. Let's see how things move. Uh, guys, hi, good morning. Hi, good, good morning, morning, Anuj. Guys. Morning, Prashant. And up 100 points now, right, on the SGX Nifty, yeah. so indicating a very strong start. But as you said, you know, the data is looking very good across the globe, not just the uh, GDP numbers, but even the uh, jobless claims in the US have fallen. There's a sign of labor strength that we're seeing in the US. So it's the second week that the jobless claims have fallen, and that's uh, a show of strength over there. The Dow was up quite a bit. Uh, FIS continue to buy in our own market. So FIS bought about 370 odd crores. All the domestic investors sold about 330 crores. But uh, the important bit is that the Nifty has been holding on to this 20 DMA of 17,480 for a while now. And uh, yesterday, despite the fall that we saw, those levels were protected. So let's see what happens today. You know, largely, I mean, these global uh, issues don't have, especially, you know, events like the Jackson Hole don't have a very big impact on the market. Give and take everything, you think that this is still a buy on dips market largely? It is, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, Sonia, the market, <clears throat> look, I mean, uh, nobody could have stayed in the market yesterday when it was collapsing. Uh, for, for you know, we are commentators. For, so for us, it's easier to say you know buy on dips and sell on rally. I think when you're sitting on the screen, it's it's clearly much different and much uh, tougher. The big question is how much of yesterday's last hour collapse was pure expiry play. I mean, if that is the case, the market should get back to where it fell from in no time, even after the gap up. But if that is not the case, then after the gap up, how do you approach the market? My sense is that uh, uh, you know uh, seventeen thousand seven twenty six is likely to be the first resistance. That is yesterday's high. That's where the market fell from. So if we go there, uh, not the base case, but if we go there, that will be the first hurdle. Uh, the big congestion zone for the market still is 17,800 to 18,000. Look, I mean, the, the point I keep trying to make, uh, there's absolutely no point trying to be cute here and trying to get the, the bottom. If the market takes out this zone and closes above 18,000, you will easily get another 500, 600 points. So maybe you want to wait uh, for that event. On the downside, the recent low 17,345 remains sacrosanct. Uh, of course, for the day, the big support comes in at the rising 20-day simple moving average, which is 17,484. If you breach that, then the 20-day exponential moving average, which is something which uh, near term a lot of people look at, is at 17,390, which also ties in with 17,345. So basically, we we got a range here. You know, you you, you need to play it smartly uh, if you can. Otherwise, just wait for one side to be clear and then take that uh, that that side straight. The bank Nifty is the one to watch out for. That remains the stronger index. In fact, it's taking support even as it's, it's ten-day uh, moving average. Uh, the, just one last point I want to make, and this is something which you know uh, uh, one of my mentors used to tell me. Uh, you know, this five-week series normally has a lot of volatility and in between you'll you know you'll you'll get a lot of liquidity issues as well around the 15th of this month so just just keep an eye on the on the volatility and september and october months in general are known for big gyrations it's the months in which option writers normally are taken to cleaners so uh, the the market will be very volatile over the next two months i think we've seen a teaser of that uh, uh, but the larger direction still remains on the upside let's see if that changes or not uh, Thai uh, good morning, guys. Uh, you know, I'll just say one thing. Uh, just like yesterday, last hour, the market just collapsed completely yeah. and mm. we were left wondering, scratching our heads, what really happened? In this, I would take what happened overnight in US markets with the same kind of pinch of salt, I mean, right? Uh, because, you know, it's just equities which did well. Uh, it, nothing else uh, moved. I mean, it's not as if rates sold off aggressively, at least not the front end. Uh, the dollar did not move. It's just equities. Nasdaq was up about 1.4%. Uh, S&P 500 was up uh, an equal amount. The two-year is still at 3.37. It should have come off sharply, and I'll explain why. The dollar index is still... I mean, it did uh, dip a little bit, but it's back at about 108.5, right? So it was not... Uh, it was just one leg. The, th the other two legs were, in a way, uh, missing, which is rates and uh, what happened to the dollar. Uh, so what are equities doing? They're basically vacillating between hard and soft landing expectations. 
sometimes you get data like the PMI services data earlier this week, which showed that maybe the economy, and that was a shocker, which showed that maybe the economy is slowing down much faster. And then you get uh, soft landing expectations led by what the kind of data we got last night, which is, I mean, the GDP numbers, which we just mentioned, right? Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of swinging between these two extremes. Many believe that it'll be just right. It'll be neither too cold nor too hot. I mean, the gold, the, the often used Goldilocks kind of scenario that, you know, the economy will slow down, but just slow down and not fall into a deep recession or anything, which will mean that the Fed can step back from its, uh, you know, tightening kind of mandate and things will be back to normal. So Goldilocks in that sense. Will it be so clean uh, in the real world? Usually it is not, but we'll see. We'll find out. Two comments, I think, uh, which uh, need attention. Again, I mean, it kind of shows you the diversion. So you have the Kansas City Fed president who said, and I quote, not out of the question that the Fed would hold rates above 4%. I mean, the market is pricing Fed funds rate at about 3.5% by the end of the year. And here is, uh, you know, this gentleman saying that, you know, we could hold rates above 4%, higher for longer. On the other hand, we had the Philadelphia Fed president who said, and I quote, uh, uh, you know, he basically advocated a cautious approach where the Fed would, and I quote, pause once rates get above 3.4%. Uh, by the way, uh, you know, the Philadelphia Fed president has usually historically been hawkish. And this was this statement is inter interpreted to be a little dovish. Uh, so there is a fair bit of statements being thrown around as well. We just have to wait uh, for more. In that context, we'll hear from the Fed chair himself later today. And this is a lot is made out of it. This is important in the context to where we are. But will this solve everything and give us a clear picture of the road ahead? In all likelihood, I mean, what matters for the Fed in a, in, a, in a setting like the Jackson Hole Symposium where central banks around the world are coming is credibility. You want to sound credible that we are, our mandate is this and we will do whatever it takes to get to it. So in all likelihood, he will sound hawkish. But the fact is, is it enough for markets to sell off, hit markets in any meaningful way? That's the question. Uh, you know... Just one more thing which you need to keep in mind, Chinese equities, uh, there were some headlines with, uh, with uh, positive headlines with regards to US-China, and this came on Newswires, the Dow Jones Newswire. It basically indicated that uh, Chinese companies which were listed in US exchanges and which were at risk of delisting perhaps may get an easier pass. But we don't know. And markets, by the way, popped. US markets went up 0.6% on the back of this headline. But there is not very much follow through in terms of uh, reports detailing what this would really mean, road ahead, etc. So as I said, I would take, I mean, the last hour collapse yesterday and the, the overnight big rally in the US, both with a, with a bit of a, a pinch of salt. On the Nifty, I've been saying this, 17.745 is a 61.8% retracement of the two-day fall we saw last Friday and this Monday. So maybe, I mean, that's the kind of uh, uh, level to watch out for. We are away from that level after yesterday's collapse than we were maybe mid-session yesterday. Uh, but I think we just have to uh, pick up from where we left off last night. The big event, I think, no doubt, will be what Fed Chair Powell indicates to the market and the market reaction later today. Sonia. Also, you know, yesterday when I saw this chart, I mean, it's the start of a new series, a September series, yeah. right? Uh, there's this song by Green Day. I don't know if you've heard it. Wake me up when September ends. Uh, I hope the bulls don't have to say that after looking at that, you know, that steep fall that we've seen. I mean... Like they say, sell in May and You know, and that, to the point that Anuj made, right, I think it's interesting uh, because uh, we had, I, I remember, I think Paul Schlute, who came on mm. the program a couple of uh, days back, a very outspoken, you know, out there kind of person. In always interesting to hear his views because he doesn't mince words. He said, usually what happens in later into the year, you get these financial accidents mm. uh, when you're going through a tough phase. Mm. The reason he explained for something like that to happen is because, you know, people look at the end of the year and say, well, things are still not getting okay. I mean, things are still tough. And they look into the next year and they say, well, you know, we're going to start another year in this kind of condition. Yeah. That's when things start to unravel a little. He called it a 40 car uh, car crash, you know, like a pile up. <laughs> yeah. He said that's when you get those kind of things. He didn't say we will get that. Mm. But I mean, the likelihood of that uh, sort of rises as we end, uh, roll into the end of the year. Yeah, you know, uh, uh, Sonia, uh, <clears throat> you know, just, just, just sitting on this seat for so many years, you know, just watching the market and all. There are some things which, you know, you perhaps cannot explain. Uh, uh, the, the point here on, about the month of September and October is, uh, especially especially on, in the years in which you have an ugly May or June period, uh, is when you have, uh, you know, after a, sort of an ugly May, uh, the market starts to sort of lick its wounds. 
uh, and you know has a bit of a rally in sort of June, July, maybe even some part of August. And just when you you know it looks like everything is getting back to normal, uh, comes this month of September and October. So uh, they they known to be brutal months, but. Uh, Look, I mean, uh, history does not often repeat. I mean, it rhymes, but it's not necessary that it repeats every time. But just it, you know, helps to remember what happened, you know, last few years back. Or so. Okay, well, uh, for now, the SGX Nifty at least is indicating that the start will be well in the green. So we have our day sorted if you're a bull. Uh, the US futures, though, are a tad bit lower, I guess, just getting into wait and watch mode. But the two-day Jackson Hole Symposium is what everyone's talking about. It's underway. CNBC Steve Leesman spoke to the Philadelphia Fed President Patrick Harker to get a sense of the central bank's stand on rate hikes, on inflation, on recessionary risks and a lot more. Listen in to what they had to say. I don't know exactly yet because the data needs to let that play out. But we need to get to a restrictive stance, which we'll do by the end of the year. And then we need to see how things turn out. That is, we, we don't need to rush way up and then way down. We need to go up and sit for a while and let things play out. We talk about long and variable lags. We actually have to believe it and let this play out a little bit. So I want to see the next reading and then decide. Next that, inflation reading? Yeah, next inflation reading. That said, I want to put this in a bit of a historical context. Since 1983, the Fed has raised rates 86 times. 75 of those we're under 50 basis points. And I think we have to recognize that a 50 basis point move is still a substantial move. So whether it's 50 or 75, I can't say right now, but let's not think that 75 is not a substantial move. Uh, 50 is a substantial move. I think right now, in terms of policy, we need to get inflation under control no matter what. And so I, I don't know if it matters a whole lot whether we call it a recession or not technically. It is an odd recession if it were a recession, sure. right, in, given the job market, the strength of the job market. So I don't think we can call it a recession, but that's not my job. That's the NBER's job. Okay. Well, no one wants to call a recession just yet, but uh, nevertheless, that's the big event to watch. But we have some comments coming through on the equity side, and this is a slightly complicated one. Lawrence Belanco of CLSA says that the combination of a DMARC 9 exhaustion signal and extreme reading provided on the daily RSI, uh, as well as an overhead resistance provided by the April high at 18,173, has resulted in the anticipated correction. He notes uh, that a similar DMARC exhaustion sell signals had occurred just before the October 2021, Jan 2022 and March 2022 high. Lawrence says the 50 DMA is currently at 16,541. A break below that would maintain the downtrend behaviour and leave the market vulnerable to a retest of the June lows. He adds on the upside, a break above 18,173 area would be a bullish event, signalling an end to the corrective price action, providing an upside objective of 20,185. However, he also notes in the near term, risk remains to the downside for at least a test of the 50 DMA. So 16,540 is his base case, I guess. He's expecting the markets to touch that. Yeah, I think the exhaustion played out and now on the downside, I think that's the level at which he's expecting some support. 